Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the second press conference of EGU 23, which is the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. I'm Gillian D'Souza. I'm EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I would like to welcome our wonderful speakers today. Um, I will quickly go into introducing them in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to share that this year we've got about 17,000 abstracts submitted to EGU's meeting. And our press conferences um, are here to highlight some of the best and most unique studies with you. So um, each press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations, followed by a question and answer period at the end. Uh, if you're joining us virtually, then save your questions to the end and we will come to you um, in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the press conference. So I'm going to now go ahead and introduce our speakers to make for faster transitions. This press conference is titled Emirates Mars Mission, First Results from Deimos, Mars's Mysterious Moon. Um, our speakers today are Hessa Al Matrushi from she's the Emirates Mars Mission Science Deputy Project Manager, Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, Dubai, UAE. Then we have Justin Deegan, who's research scientist, laboratory for atmospheric and space physics. University of Colorado, Boulder, US. And then we have Christopher, who's Associate Professor, Department of Astronomy and Planetary Science, Northern Arizona University, US. And we are now ready to hear from all three of them. But before that, we have a super cool, stunning video for you to kick things off. slides loaded. Feel free to just jump in and take over. Thank you. Okay. The mic is working. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so welcome, everyone. We're here to present um, the first results that we got from the Demos campaign from the Emirates Mars mission. I would like first to start and introduce the Emirates Mars mission science. So we started the science phase in 2021, and the mission was designed to study the Martian atmosphere for a full Martian year. So we're able to get a comprehensive image of the Martian atmosphere and its layer um, to study it through all the seasons and to understand what's happening from day to night for a full Martian year. For that, we do have three scientific objectives. We're looking into the weather systems in the lower atmosphere, we're looking into the upper atmosphere, it's the escape of hydrogen and oxygen, and we're even studying the link in between them. This is why the mission was designed. And for that, we do have three scientific instruments. The first one is called the Emirates Mars Infrared Spectrometer. So this is where we're looking at Mars from the thermal infrared band, um, and we're taking information about the lower atmosphere. The second one is the Mertz Exploration Imager, EXI. This is where we're taking beautiful visible images of Mars and we do have bands on the ultraviolet as well. And then the third one is the Mertz Mars Ultraviolet Spectrometer. 
this is the instrument that we're using to look at Mars from the extreme ultraviolet and the far ultraviolet studying the upper atmosphere of Mars. Using uh, these instruments and the science objectives that we had, the mission was designed to give us novel science, a new science that is needed from the community to get the first. And the first thing that we aim to is to get the first global, seasonal, and urinal coverage of the full Martian year for the Martian atmosphere. So you can see from the plots that we have in here that we do have a full coverage, uh, seasonal coverage. We do look at Mars uh, globally uh, from the different instrumentations and bands. And while we do have such beautiful coverage and comprehensive one, we're able to get discoveries as well um, from the viewpoint that we had. So we were able to get our first global views of the aurora, where we discovered the sinuous discrete aurora, as well as the patchy portent aurora. And we were able to look at things that we haven't expected, like we were looking at complex structures in the upper atmosphere, things that we haven't seen before. So what I'm trying to say is the mission is unique in the way that it looks at Mars, and it's revealing events and phenomena that we haven't seen before. Um, summarizing the science that we've done in numbers, so we have 20, more than 20 scientific papers published in peer review and under review uh, right now. We have more than 115 participations in conferences since Mars orbit insertion, so we're always out talking about the results that we're doing from this mission. We have more than two terabyte worth of data publicly available for researchers and scientists to use. And we have seen a lot of engagement as well from the public using the data. And there is more than 4.5 terabyte of data that had been downloaded. And we've seen a lot of engagement in social media, people using the data, which we're very proud of. With all this science, this was enabled by a very unique orbit in comparison to other Mars missions. The orbit that we have from HOPE has a very wide elliptical shape. It's 20,000 kilometers by 43,000 kilometers. And what you can see in there is an opportunity to observe Deimos very close by, an opportunity that wasn't available to spacecraft before because they were very much close to Mars. So we've seen this opportunity and we knew that this is something that we want to do, but we were focusing on the primary science objectives until we came into the end of the primary science mission, the beginning of this year. Uh, where we saw a fit time um, to observe the Martian moon, Deimos. So let me give you some information about the Deimos campaign. So we started this campaign late January this year. Uh, we had our closest approach to Deimos at around 100 kilometers on March 10, 2023. So about a month and a half before. We took observations for the uh, for Deimos from our three scientific instruments. And for us to get this result, we've made minor maneuvers, three of them, to the orbit. The orbit didn't change in terms of shapes, but these minor maneuvers enabled us to have a closer look at Deimos, and it enabled future opportunities to look at Deimos after this encounter. So we're promising more data to come on Deimos as well. And the good thing that we're very excited about that our science has been consistent, although like we're making Deimos observation, we've made small maneuvers, this is not impacting our science observation. So we will still sample the Martian atmosphere as we used to do in the primary science mission. So why we're observing the Deimos uh, as a moon? What's exciting about it? So. Deimos is one of the two Martian moons. It's the smaller one, and it's the further away from it. It's because of these two things, it had been less observed, so we don't have a lot of information about it. Not a lot of measurements have been done before. And there is the debate and in science questions open about the origins of both Deimos and Phobos, like where they captured asteroids, or are they coming from Mars impact debris? So... These open questions, there is an opportunity to get them answered using the observations that we're giving. This is the science motivation behind this campaign. 
And now I would like to um, give the floor to Justin, which will give us insight on what we've been able to achieve throughout the Demos campaign. All right, thank you, Hessa. So as Hessa said, I will start walking through the observations that we've uh, collected with EMM, and then I'll turn it over to Christopher. Um, so first of all, uh, it's worth walking through how we observe Deimos. So this is a flyby. This is some of the closest flybys um, since the 70s when the Viking orbiters um, first observed Deimos. We're able to do many more of these than previous missions for the reasons that Hesse described. And what we have up on the screen here um, is a short animation of images taken by the EXI instrument. Um, so this is using one of its visible filters. And you can see the geometry of the flyby uh, in the panel on the right. Um, uh, this is two scale. And so hopefully it will, there we go. So uh, you can see the spacecraft comes in um, and this is the approach. At closest approach, we were just about 100 kilometers away from the object. And you can see Mars there in the background. Uh, and then we move away again. And so um, you can see that in order to observe Deimos continuously, we had to rotate the spacecraft. Um, all three instruments are on an observation deck and we're able to simultaneously observe throughout this time period. So we'll let that run through one more time. And we'll talk more about these data, or Christopher will talk more about this data um, in several minutes. So um, as I said, the the orbit allows us to obtain systematic information. Um, we're able to do these flybys repeatedly, which is a new opportunity. Um, what we're gonna be presenting here was acquired on March 10th during the closest flyby. Uh, we had a number of these before and after, and as Hessa mentioned, we'll be doing more of them in the future later this year. So these data sets um, are unique um, but they are building on previous observations made by other spacecraft and from telescopic observations. So we're, we're hoping to learn, and what we will talk about in a moment in terms of preliminary results, are trying to distinguish between uh, what the possible origin scenarios for these objects are. And so understanding what we know about Phobos and Deimos and comparing and contrasting helps us understand um, you know, how to interpret these objects either as captured asteroids, as um, being coalesced material from a Mars impact, being debris from a moon that broke up at some point in the past. You know, these are all things that people have speculated about. So you can see some highlights here. We have images from um, in the infrared from EMIRS, in the visible from EXI, and in the far ultraviolet from EMUS. Um, I'm going to talk next about some of the EMUs observations in more detail, and then Christopher will uh, walk us through the EMUs and the EXI observations. So um, EMUs is the most sensitive ultraviolet spectrometer that has ever orbited Mars. That's important for these observations because Deimos is very dark, um, just a couple of percent reflectivity. And the sun is not very bright in the far ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet. So that sensitivity um, means that EMUs is very well suited for this kind of novel observation. Now, in terms of scientific utility of these observations, um, there's actually a lot you can learn about a small body like this in the extreme and far ultraviolet uh, because those wavelengths depend on the composition of the body, whether it has organics um, or if it's made of more basaltic or rocky material, and also how much space weathering the body has experienced over the course of the solar system's history. So in, on this image, um, I'm trying to explain a little bit about how EMUs makes a picture. Unlike the EXI camera, uh, EMUs is a spectrometer and uh, it requires the spacecraft to scan it across an object in order to make a 2D image. And so I'm going to run a little animation here that shows you the data um, on the detector of the instrument on the left. 
And the field of view uh, is shown on the right as that magenta stripe. So we call this the airglow slit. And so you can see how as the field of view scanned across to Deimos, um, the, uh, the signal comes and goes in the image on the left. And what you're seeing here is a spectral spatial image. And so the spectral dimension, we gain information about the composition um, and the reflectivity of the object. And this just um, shows there's a real wealth of information. There's a full spectrum behind every pixel of the images that we acquire. Um, there's some other things to note. We can see stars in the background. Um, some of these are very faint stars that you would not be able to see with your naked eye. And then um, Mars actually goes by in the background as well. So to talk uh, a little bit about the science that we can pull out of these images, um, this is a two color composite. Um, and what we've done here is that the red channel contains uh, an image when we add up all of the light that was collected by EMUs within its band pass from 100 to 160 nanometers. The blue uh, is a specific wavelength that is uh, scattered sunlight from hydrogen. And this actually fills the solar system. And so what we're seeing in this image is the fact that um, the hydrogen sort of backlit lights this image of Deimos. And so you can see the dark edge, the night side of Deimos um, in its silhouette against the glowing sky and hydrogen. Um, the rest of the image uh, where you see whitish or reddish, that's just sunlight reflected directly off of the object itself. Okay, and then finally, uh, this is the measured demo spectrum. So this is an average reflectance spectrum for the object. Um, we can see that the, the general structure is consistent with reflected sunlight. The sun has a lot of uh, emission features that are well understood in this range. Um, so this all looks pretty well as expected. When we divide that out, we're able to see what the reflectance of the surface is. And um, that's the image on the bottom panel. You can see that this is a relatively flat spectrum. There aren't a lot of features after we do that division. And so um, this is actually a pretty important result because if Deimos were a D-type asteroid, which is one of the hypotheses, um, we would expect to see some signatures of organics or um, carbon-rich minerals. And those are not apparent in the spectrum. Um, if they're there, they're very minute. And so this is suggestive that Deimos um, is not, in fact, a D-type asteroid and may lend some support to the uh, Martian material source hypothesis. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Christopher to tell us more about EMIRS and EXI. Yeah, thanks, Justin. So um, <clears throat> some of the things that uh, we did with the other two instruments are very complementary to the, the EMUs instrument. And so we have two additional instruments. I'm going to talk about the infrared spectrometer first, uh, and then we'll talk about the camera. We'll save the, the pretty pictures for last. Uh, so EMIRS is a Fourier transform infrared point spectrometer. And so just kind of like EMUs has to build up an image with time, so does EMIRS. And so each little spot that you see there is about a two second integration. And what you'll notice is that, you know, some spots are bigger, some spots are smaller. That corresponds to when the spacecraft was moving by Deimos faster. So when you have kind of these smaller spots, it's, it's closer to the body. When you have bigger spots, it's further away. Um, and so for EMIRS, we broke up our scans into sort of three separate uh, observation time periods. We had the kind of incoming, the closest approach, and then the outgoing. And that allowed us to really tune the observation strategy to get the best coverage that we can uh, could. One of the interesting things that I even think we weren't necessarily expecting to be able to do, but because of that geometry that Justin showed, where you were kind of coming in from the pole and then looking, you know, you would basically rotate the spacecraft, we're actually able to get almost complete coverage of the body um, in that we can, you know, you can see it here, basically, there's only a thin, thin area where we weren't able to see. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty unique, actually, as well. And uh, these are the highest resolution infrared data uh, that we have of Deimos. Uh, a similar data set was taken 
uh, by the Mars Global Surveyor TESS instrument, thermal emission spectrometer instrument, which is uh, kind of the fifth generation. This is the fifth generation version of that, their heritage instruments to one another. And that was done for Phobos. So we have a really great data set to already compare uh, Demos to, which is, has never been done before. So what can we learn from uh, EMIRs? There's a couple of interesting things that we can take away. So the first thing that you can do with EMIRs in the infrared is you can measure how much energy is emitted from the surface. So that means you can tell the surface temperature. From that surface temperature, we can actually get a sense of the um, physical properties of the surface. We can say, oh, is it made of coarse grained things like you might see on other asteroids in our solar system like Bennu or uh, Ryugu, which are made of these nice blocky materials, or is it super fine grain material like we maybe see on the moon, right? The moon's regolith is this super fine grained powder. Uh, and so what we see with Deimos is that it falls more on the line of a very fine grained particulate material, you know, on the order of sort of micron size uh, regolith covering the entire surface. That's also really consistent with Phobos. Uh, so it's kind of more like the moon's surface than some of these other asteroids that we've seen before. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that when you look at the poles of Deimos, when you have these kind of areas that are shadowed, they are very low temperature. They are about 100 Kelvin. And that's well within the range that you can actually trap volatiles, at least on kind of a, a short time scale. So we don't think there's probably permanently shadowed regions like you see on the moon uh, or anything like that on Deimos, but we do think there are times and there are seasons because of the way that Deimos works that you might be able to kind of temporarily trap some volatiles on this uh, surface. So in addition to that thermophysical data or that temperature data, we're able to take spectral data. So Amirs has uh, about 150 different wavelengths that it can measure. And from those measurements, we're able to do a comparison to both previous spacecraft data, but also laboratory data. And we can say, you know, we have a sample of Tagish Lake, for example, which is what you're seeing here on the left. And that's a good example for a D-type asteroid. And so we can measure those samples in the lab. Uh, this is from a paper that uh, I was a part of in 2018, where we did measure Tagish Lake in the lab and compared it to those test results uh, for Phobos. Now, if we take the same you know, analogy and we compare those uh, data to what we see from EMIRS from Deimos, we can see that there's some pretty interesting uh, similarities, but also some important differences. And so the, the similarities between TESS and Phobos indicate that these two things are you know, probably made of similar materials, although they're a little bit different. Uh, and then the second thing that we can pretty definitively say is their spectra or their spectral properties don't look like a D-type asteroid. Uh, and so they're more consistent with basaltic material, which would be a volcanic rock, uh, which is what Mars is made of, all right, uh, as opposed to this carbonaceous chondrite asteroid. And so those two things, when you couple Emir's uh, compositional information with the lack of organics and carbon uh, bearing minerals that you see from emus, those again lend the, to the interpretation that these are in fact not D-type asteroids, but in, in more you know, likely scenario, we think uh, derived from Mars, probably from some giant impact. Um, the interesting part, uh, about that, and, and it raises questions about, and, and helps us start to understand questions like, why does our solar system and the, some of the rocky bodies in our solar system have, you know, why do they have different moons? Why does Earth have a giant moon? Maybe Mars has these kind of two tiny moons. Venus has no moon. Mercury has no moon. So it tells us a little bit about sort of the diversity of early planetary processes that may be going on in our solar system, right? And so there's some definitely uh, interesting things about that going on here. So uh, EXI is our uh, high resolution imager that we have uh, on board the Emirates Mars mission. It's a filter wheel based imager. So unlike your camera, um, it has to take a picture and then it moves a little filter wheel to a different uh, band pass. And then it takes, you know, it's blue picture and then it's red picture. and so. There's a time delay between these different images uh, that get acquired uh, no matter what we do. 
uh, unlike your camera that you know takes red, green, and blue all at the same time. Um, so from EXI, we're able to capture this fine scale morphology or uh, surface appearance uh, at better than 10 meters per pixel uh, over you know basically the entire far side of Deimos. And so what we see from this is that the surface is pretty smooth. You can see some fresh craters in this image, and you can see some really pretty degraded craters uh, in this image, which is maybe a little surprising for, for such a small body. Uh, and what we kind of can interpret with that as well as that kind of very fine-grained surface that we are seeing from uh, Emir's data is probably uh, you know, exactly what we expect to see in these high-resolution uh, images. So uh, just to kind of wrap up, here's a, an image taken uh, that has both Deimos and Mars in it. Uh, pretty spectacular uh, you know, set of uh, images here. And then so the, the summary here that we'll end on is that you know, EMM has modified its orbit uh, very minorly uh, to enable these really close flybys. And we expect to see these uh, happen pretty regularly in the future on a cadence of a couple of, a couple of couple of times uh, or once every couple of weeks. There we go. Uh, and uh, the question then is like, how often do we observe that? Well, well, we'll do it when we get below kind of a unique science threshold, right? So we'll, we won't necessarily take every time to do this, but we'll be strategic about that so we can make sure we're observing Deimos in different lighting conditions or geometries that can help uh, further refine some of these uh, questions that we have. Uh, so EMUSE has produced these uh, FUV, EUV uh, spectral images. They're super fantastic, as Justin talked about, and to help us constrain those uh, organics on the surface. Uh, EMIRS has this highest thermal infrared, highest resolution thermal infrared data taken that help us constrain its composition and physical properties of the surface. And then uh, EXI has these really nice high resolution images that provide a, a kind of synoptic view uh, of the body. So all at once. Uh, that we'll continue to leverage as we go forward. And so the kind of preliminary analysis that we have right now suggests that these are, uh, or that both probably Deimos and Phobos are not captured asteroids, but in fact, maybe uh, pieces of Mars that have coalesced after a, a large impact. And then we'll just leave it with uh, this image up here. So here's a color composite uh, taken by the red, green, and blue channels of EXI. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty fantastic image, I think. So, questions? Thank you, all three of you, for that very interesting presentation. Um, and that's the perfect segue, Chris, into our next part of the press conference, which is the question and answer round. So if anyone has questions, if you're in the room, please raise your hand. I'll pass the mic over to you. You can introduce yourself and then let us know um, who you have your question for. If you're joining us online, you have two options. You can um, raise your hand on the Zoom function, and then we'll come to you uh, for your question. You can also type your question in the chat, and we will take it that way. So if anyone wants to go, okay, we have one already. Hello, um, Javier Barbusano, a freelance journalist. Um, have you seen anything that can tell uh, a little bit about the age of Deimos? and uh, also uh, the effects that the space weathering and being so long out there in the space uh, can have in the spectrum so that you and its composition yeah so there are certain you know expected um, effects of space weathering i think we're just getting to the point where we can you know we've said the things that we're confident about today <laughs> But there's a lot more analysis to do. And actually, um, at least for the ultraviolet, one of the limiting factors is what we know about how uh, various materials behave under the effects of space weathering. So one of the things that may happen is that we realize there are laboratory uh, experiments that need to be done um, in order to better you know, understand what kinds of materials could explain the spectrum that we've uh, uncovered. It wouldn't be the first time people looked at an object at Mars um, and saw things in the ultraviolet that weren't expected, and we had to go do lab work to figure out what we were looking at. Um, was there a part for? Yeah, so as far as the age goes, um, I think the kind of smoothness of the surface and the relatively crater-free thing, uh, the relatively crater-free appearance of the surface kind of 
give some indication that you know I think the surface is is probably pretty old because you're seeing kind of this destruction of craters and you can see like there's actually one on the screen right here that's sort of on the I don't know the left side I guess of that crater that uh, on the left side of Deimos that looks pretty kind of you know degraded and so I think we're seeing you know either one the the body is not very competent so it's not retaining its craters um, and they're kind of breaking down quickly or you know I, I think that personally I think that's what's happening at this point but it's hard to say kind of explicitly but the the surface is pretty smooth like I think I would expect more craters you know if it was a super old body um, but that could also be an influence of how close it is to Mars as well right so maybe the uh you know impactors are getting pulled to Mars as opposed to hitting this thing so I don't know it's the short version okay we have another question coming in yes thanks a lot uh Rich Blaustein freelance journalist writing for Physics World um any measurements of Deimos um Brett width and compared to the sister moon too yeah so um a lot of those actually had Kind of come into existence already uh, from from previous uh, measurements or from previous observations, and so what we're doing here really is kind of refining those uh, measurements and especially taking into account the far side geometry, right? And so I will get the numbers wrong, but it's like half the size or a little less. It's like twelve kilometers across versus Phobos, which is um, quite a bit bigger. I don't actually remember how big Phobos is off the top of my head, um, but yeah, it's about two times. Uh, smaller and so some of the things that we're you know looking forward to and, and just like with the rest of uh, EMM data is that we publish these data you know freely right so anybody can go get these data and I one of the things that we're um, anticipating the community is going to do is update the shape model uh, for Deimos which will be you know a very large asset for future missions coming up like uh, MMX by JAXA and so we think there's a lot of synergies between this kind of work that we're doing now that will will help prepare for some of these upcoming missions do we have any more questions there don't seem to be any questions um from our virtual journalists so if there are no more questions in the room then we are quite ready to wrap up today's press briefing so okay it doesn't look like more questions oh you do okay sure so what was there anything that's like unexpected or surprising that you found i can go first i'll say what i think um so some of the things that i think were sort of surprising uh to me were were or is basically that the the spectrum of phobos and demos are are not the same um, I was expecting them to be more similar, to be honest, uh, measured by similar instruments, you know, all, all things kind of held constant. Uh, and the fact that they're not quite the same is really interesting. And so there's definitely a story in there. Maybe one is, you know, more mafic than the other, uh, which kind of jives a little bit with the uh, brightness story. So Phobos is a lot brighter than Deimos. They're, Phobos, I think, is two times brighter or something like that in the visible than Deimos. And so there's, that's kind of one surprise to me. I think as far as the spectral interpretation goes, I think that's also a pretty big surprise uh, because that's something that, you know, again, we're sort of helping narrow down these two competing hypotheses for uh, this moon or these moons, both of them really. You know, if we saw one that looked one way and one that looked completely different, I think that would be also unexpected but instead what we're seeing is there's some nice consistencies between these two and I think again it does lend to that story that they're I think they're probably uh more likely to be you know coalesced pieces of Mars from a giant impact which again I sort of alluded to this before has implications for how you form moons in our solar system right and so there's big questions that I think are now if you take these as pieces of Mars that formed you know maybe not unlike our moon formed with a big impact and Maybe this impact was a little bit smaller, but then you have to ask questions like, well, why doesn't Venus have a moon or moons? And why did Earth get one big moon? And why did Mars get two small moons? And why doesn't Mercury have a moon? So there's all kinds of questions that this really um, stirs, I think. You guys have anything else you want to add? 
Yeah, I would say for the ultraviolet, um, it's kind of hard to be surprised when you don't know what you're going to see because no one had gotten a spectrum at these wavelengths before. Um, but I will say I was pleasantly surprised by the high quality of the data. Um, we knew that Deimos was going to be very dark. Um, we had uh, previous missions had tried to look at Phobos um, at similar wavelengths and just failed to get any signal at all. Uh, and so we were just trying to do our best to get the highest quality data and really pleased with just how well we were able to do it. Um, so did you have anything here? Yeah, and I guess one, one last thing to add, I think is just that you know, this is a pretty complicated series of maneuvers that um, EMM has been able to undertake uh, you know, to the tune of three distinct maneuvers to get these flybys and then enable future close flybys as well. And I think one of the things that, you know, gives a lot of credit to our uh, engineering team is that the outages or the amount of time that we had to turn the instruments off to stop our kind of nominal science was limited to like a couple of days total. And so, you know, to do these sort of unique kind of non-primary uh, science goals of the mission, we really only had to you know, miss a couple of days of ob observing Mars from sort of its classic weather satellite position. So I think that was pretty impressive as well. Okay, we have one more question. Hi, I have two questions. Um, one question is, when are we expecting to see those data uh, publicly available? And the other question, how often are we for future basically uh, observation of Deimos? How often will we observe Deimos? I think that's you, Hassan. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the data, the images uh, will be publicly available, but the raw data uh, will take some time to be processed and be available in our science data center. We usually release new data every three months, so that it will take it, uh, its time. Well, we don't have our normal data pipeline prepared for Deimos images as we do have for the Mars one. Uh, so that's why there would be delay, but these images that we processed for this press conference would be available. Uh, when it comes to the second question is how often would be able um, to take observations of Deimos. I believe like uh, Christopher tapped into that. So that would be once every couple of weeks that we would have the opportunity, but then it's up to the team to decide whether to take this opportunity and take observations or not. So um, if it's uh, an opportunity that is worth pursuing in terms of science, that's something that we would go for. Thank you. I think we have no more questions coming in. All right. So thank you again for your time, speakers, and for all of you joining us today. Um, this concludes our press conferences for today, uh, but be sure to join us throughout the week. We have another six exciting press cons lined up. If you need press packs, printed or digital, they're both available. Just join me in the press center and we can chat. If you need to speak to... Um, um, speak to our speakers no if you need to <laughs> interview our speakers uh, through the week then you can check in with me or terry cook uh, we are both going to be available here um and um okay i wish you a very good egu 23 week and the recording of today's press conference will be available later today so feel free to share that or access it as well and thank you again bye